For the gods keep hidden from men the means of life. Else you would easily do work enough in a day to supply you for a full year, even without working. Soon would you put away your rudder over the smoke, and the fields worked by ox and sturdy mule would run to waste. But Zeus, in the anger of his heart, hid it, because Prometheus the crafty deceived him. Therefore he planned sorrow and mischief among men. He hid fire, but that the noble son of Iapetus stole again for men from Zeus the counselor in a hollow fennel stalk, so that Zeus, who delights in thunder, did not see it. But afterwards Zeus, who gathers the clouds, said to him in anger, Son of Iapetus, surpassing all in cunning, you are glad that you have outwitted me and stolen fire, a great plague to you yourself and to men that shall be. But I will give men, as the price for fire, an evil thing, in which they may all be glad of heart while they embrace their own destruction. So said the father of men and gods, and laughed aloud, and he bade famous Hephaestus make haste to mix earth with water, and to put in it the voice and strength of humankind, and fashion a sweet, lovely maiden shape, like to the immortal goddesses in face, and Athena to teach her needlework and the weaving of the varied web, and golden Aphrodite to shed grace upon her head, and cruel longing and cares that weary the limbs. And he charged Hermes, the guide, the slayer of Argus, to put in her a shameless mind and a deceitful nature. Hi, hello, and welcome. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I'm your host, Liv. She who has managed to make a distinctly feminist Greek mythology podcast into one of the biggest mythology podcasts in the world. Turns out we do like to learn and care about ancient and mythological women. Who knew? Not Hesiod. That's who. The passage I read at the top of this episode is from Hesiod's Works and Days, his lesser-known work, and the one that is considerably more misogynistic. If you listened to the re-aired episodes from last week about Pandora, you probably remember that section. I might have even read it to you. Actually, frankly, I don't remember because I did that episode two years ago. But it felt right to read it again today because while I don't think it's fair to say that it's indicative of how men in ancient Greece saw women broadly... It is certainly an example of how they were seen by some, and in some regions. Hesiod, like Homer, probably wasn't a real person, but instead a tradition of oral storytelling. But gods, that still means people came up with such things. The Pandora of the works and days is considerably more evil, I guess, like conniving, than the one from the Theogony, which in itself has always fascinated me, given they're presented to be from the same author. There are these two different versions of Pandora, both shitty, just one is worse. Still, we are not here to talk about Pandora today. We are here to talk about women in general, women, real women of the ancient world. This episode is inspired by and mostly revolves around a book by Sarah B. Pomeroy called Goddesses, Whores, Wives, and Slaves. It's about women in ancient Greece, both goddesses and human. I've been using it on and off as a source when episodes need it, but I've been wanting to dive into it more deeply along with any other book I have about the ancient women. All sources, as always, are in the episode's description. So today, though, is about them. Women. Goddesses, but also very real human women, and what we know about their lives in that world. The introduction to Pomeroy's book includes a look at the questions that she has, and I'm going to read them to you. Quote, Did his wife Xanthippe ever hear Socrates' dialogues on beauty and truth? How many women actually read the history of Herodotus and Thucydides? What did women do instead? Most important, why was it necessary for the Athenians to make such a distinction between the culture of men and that of women? 
when pagan goddesses were, in their own way, as powerful as gods? Why was the status of human females so low? And isn't that the question? Why are the goddesses like they are when women, particularly women in places like Athens, were so constrained and had so little agency, so little control over their lives? Women of the ancient world are baffling and fascinating. This is episode 204. Turns out they're just as interesting as men. Who knew? Real Women of Ancient Greece. It all began with the mother goddess. Maybe. It seems that in the realm of those who study this, it's up for debate whether or not there was this prehistoric mother goddess that ruled all. But I would like there to be, so I'm going to talk about this regardless of whether or not it's commonly accepted among scholars currently, because I can. And because it seems it makes sense to me. If there was a prehistoric mother goddess that kind of reigned supreme, that is in the ancient world before the written words for us to decipher... That's what prehistoric means. It would make sense that when languages and warfare and everything else came into the picture, they brought with it men. (laughs) Gods. Gods to marry goddesses, to subjugate them, to put them into little boxes. It would give us an explanation for why Hera, a woman whose primary function in the actual stories is to punish women for her husband's infractions, is actually a supremely important ruling mother goddess who, for all intents and purposes is her husband's equal. The functionality of someone like Hera, this queen ruling goddess who does what she wants when she wants, is sometimes at odds with how she actually behaves in the stories themselves. The Hera of the Iliad, though, is a good example of her origins, or rather, the truth of the depths of her story. She may be known for punishing women, but ultimately she was herself a woman willing to stand up to her husband, tell him what she thought, when he was wrong, and to fight him at every turn. The idea of this older, prehistoric goddess also could explain characters like Artemis, a woman who's expressly presented as a quote-unquote virgin, even though her role in the lives of humans included things like childbirth, menstruation, uh, the raising and protecting of young girls and women. Because she existed before. Before the men and their patriarchy came in and turned her into their notion of a virgin. She was unmarried, and thus, according to men, she was a virgin. It reminds me of one of my other favorite theories, that one of the reasons we don't really have stories of women explicitly being with other women sexually in mythology and history isn't because it wasn't actually happening or that it wasn't understood by those listening to the stories, but instead because the men came in to record everything and create what remains today. And they wouldn't have seen two women engaging in sexual activity as sex at all. They have this real thing for the concept of penetration. And so without that, I don't know, it was just ladies having a nice time together. I like to think this meant that women in the real world had a kind of hidden agency in their own lives. They were allowed to spend their time with other women, and if the men didn't see actions between women as sexual, if they were into it, they were probably able to have uh, quite a lot of fun with their friends, you know, when they were so inclined. (laughs) Artemis almost certainly had a lot of fun with her nymph friends, but because she never married a man, we get to call her a virgin. (laughs) But I'm getting ahead of myself, because these are just my own theories. Let's talk about facts, or rather, what the collective we, being smart people of the world who write books on such topics, what they think about ancient women. The position of women in antiquity is a hard one to figure out. The voices of women are almost entirely left out of the literary record. The texts we have are mostly written by men and concerned with men's interests. You know, as if I haven't told you all this a million times in a million different ways. When women do factor in, it's often from the perspective of what is proper and good versus what is disapproved of. We don't often get the actual concerns and feelings of the women involved. They exist in the male voice for the reader or listener, who are also men, to consume and not within their own right. 
The matter of what was being written, whether it was a history, an oration, a play of some sort, entirely influenced what is being said about women, rather than them appearing in the historical record as themselves. It's not entirely a vacuum. There's not no women in the historical record, but it's seriously rare to have women's voices direct from the ancient world. And when they do exist, they're fragmentary at best, or understudied, undertranslated, or all of the above. For all intents and purposes, they were only mentioned when it was relevant, and even then, it was often brief. And we know that isn't accurate to what real life would have been like. Women had to be around, simply because they make up like half of the population, and people with uteri are pretty important when it comes to, you know, populating everything. Fortunately, when it comes to understanding at least a little about real women, there are a few places that we can turn to. Though often these are very specific to Athenian women, which were a beast of their own. They were particularly oppressed compared to the rest of ancient Greece, but they're also often one of the only reference points that we have. Hence, like everything I used to say in the early days of this podcast, before I went on to understand that that common knowledge of these things is based almost entirely on Athenian sources. So while we think we have this idea of women being always oppressed and always lacking in all freedom, that was really Athenian. But regardless, they are often what we have. So just keep that in mind when we're talking about women in plays and things, which I'm about to, that those that survive are exclusively Athenian. Still, plays are a major reference point because of the volume of them that actually survive. And it's interesting to look at them and how each genre approaches women. Tragedy exists in its own little sphere because of this need to meet requirements of the genre, so it can take liberties and allow certain inconsistencies in service of the plot. Add in the largely mythological stories and what you get is not an accurate representation of what life would have looked like. Tragedy just doesn't need to be realistic. It often even exists in these like really very different timelines that don't fit with anything simply because of the nature of the stories. Their purpose was to be tragic. Comedy, however, differs in that you can really play with reality. Scholars and readers alike can dissect social history from the scenarios that we see in these, because often what is comic about these plays is how it turns conventions on their heads. The humor is in the absurdity of the situation. It's in taking the mundane and making it obscene or far-fetched that the hilarity ensues. And it's often why some Greek comedies, <coughs> looking at you, Thesmophoria Zusai, don't work as well in the modern day. Because these situations are not so absurd, and the implications that they could be is downright offensive. We've made some progress, folks. Just a little bit. All that being said, that doesn't mean that these plays don't have a place within modern scholarship or thought. They absolutely do in how they can shine light on social conventions and people of their time and provide things that we simply do not get from the historical genre record. Of course, these are just some of the literary genres that we can see in antiquity that add to the historical knowledge, but there's another large area of evidence that often gets set aside, particularly by myself, because I don't have as much knowledge in it. That is the material record. Archaeology. Not the big flashy treasures that some early archaeologists sought to uncover, looking at you, Schliemann, but the excavation of more mundane, everyday sites. I understand that we all love really exciting treasure, like Indiana Jones style, but that is not everything that the material record leaves behind for us. And Indiana Jones is, by definition, an awful archaeologist. Dude destroys everything. But we allow him, because of 1980s Harrison Ford. But I digress. We are talking real archaeology. Real, modern archaeology can teach us so much about the ancient world, particularly when those mundane, everyday things are the ones being studied. 
Take, for instance, the home. The home is full of everyday things that we take for granted. They're just so much a part of the day-to-day that we don't stop to consider what these objects say about us and our society. Our a hairbrush is just a simple object that we use in one part of the day. The table where we get some work done. The French press that we're also thankful for. The Lego pyramid that I've been putting together. <laughs> All these things in some far off future could help an archaeologist piece together what life was like for us at this time. The pyramid might be particularly interesting and maybe particularly confusing. Just imagine! Still, these normal little everyday things, everyday life things, actually say quite a bit about us and what our culture looks like. What's expected or enjoyed by us, how we spend our time, what we care about. There are objects just like these in Greek archaeology as well, though perhaps no Lego pyramids. Seriously, archaeologists are the best. I just spent three days with a bunch of them nerding out on everything imaginable, and so I can particularly vouch for how fascinating and fun they are. Plus, sometimes there's Spice Girls and Disney karaoke with past conversation guests like Victoria Austin. But again, I digress. (laughs) What we find in the home, the oikos of ancient Greece, can give us so much more information on women than we might expect. The oikos really was the domain of the woman. Again, particularly in Athens, where she was excluded from public life, and so practically her entire life was there in this private sphere. And so we do find things that tell us about the lives of women, from loom weights, perfume bottles, little boxes called pixis, to home kitchen implements, bottles for babies, jewelry. These are all pretty simple objects that in the moment might not mean much to the owner. Sure, some of them could be sentimental, like maybe one woman's pixis was a gift from her mother who she might rarely, if ever, get to see again after marriage. Who knows? But these things can tell us so much about the women living at this time, regardless of what kind of value they held. What their daily lives actually looked like, what could have been important to them, how they spent their time. These material objects really bring us closer to the women living, you know, 2,500 plus years ago in a way that the literature just cannot match, especially when it comes to women. So those are our sources, sometimes things like plays and text, but also sometimes just like the very everyday life things. Are you getting tired of me talking about sources in these historical episodes? Such is life. They're fascinating. And I promise we're heading right back into deep mythology after this episode. But in the meantime, it's very important that we be aware of where we're getting our information. And nerds, it's just fucking fascinating, and I intend to convince you all of that fact if I haven't already. So that's just some of the information on the how and the why and the where when it comes to understanding ancient women and the lives they might have led. But obviously one of the most important things to remember is that what we consider as ancient Greece, that is in terms of what I care about, pre-Christian ancient Greece, there are about 4,000 years to contend with. That is a long time, if you're curious, and things can change in that amount of time. Just take it into, like, I am talking 4,000 years of history before that Jesus guy that we went and based our modern dating system on. It's only been another 2,000 years since then. Literally only half that amount of time has passed. Half since Jesus. That's how old the ancient Greek record is. Of course, in the very early Bronze Age and the prehistoric period, which is, again, that time before the written record, there isn't quite as much that we have to work with. But if you learn anything by visiting, like, say, the National Archaeological Museum in Athens, or really any museum that houses prehistoric and Bronze Age artifacts from the ancient Mediterranean, you will learn that they have been around for a seriously long time. Google Cycladic figurines. I promise you won't regret it. They're little alien dudes with little boobs and lots of other... They're amazing. (laughs) And the Cycladic Islands of Greece have been home to humans creating artwork for those, like, 6,000 plus years. And they have some of the most fascinating pieces you can imagine. That's where those goddess figurines come in. Or maybe they're not meant to be goddesses, per se, just a bunch of people. Regardless, they're amazing and I'm obsessed with them. But whether or not there was a prehistoric goddess 
mother goddess, reigning goddess, like I believe, in the region who ruled all, <sighs> that women were featured heavily in the art of Bronze Age is not up for debate, fortunately. The women presented in Bronze Age Crete artwork and Cretan broadly beyond the island are some of the most fun and fascinating examples of ancient women and maybe what their lives could have looked like, at least in part. The women depicted in the art of Bronze Age Crete and beyond, like, say, Santorini, which was a kind of Minoan colony just up north, everything depicted in that whole region, they're just... Anything during the Minoan period, they're living their best lives. They have these long flowing dresses that are all colorful and they swish around in that satisfying way, but then they're low cut too, so the, just their tits are out. Again, living their best lives. They're depicted dancing, or better yet, holding snakes above their heads and looking like they're about to rain vengeance down on any man who might wrong them. And sometimes, like in the art found on Santorini, in the town preserved by the volcanic eruption, Akrotiri, sometimes they're just picking flowers. So that's nice too. And there's monkeys. They help. Living the best life. Truly. I could talk about this forever. Can you tell? But I'm getting ahead of myself because I am obsessed with those figurines and Bronze Age artwork and Akrotiri and the idea that maybe there was this dominant mother goddess in the prehistoric period because I just desperately want there to have been one. Fortunately, I have Michaela to keep me honest and uh, helping me script more concrete things about this time period that are actually accepted by scholars. let alone the prehistoric period before it, was a time of limited security. A culture would need to find ways to keep themselves fed, protected, to thrive. And that's why primarily the surviving architecture that we have from this period are these like enormous palaces, we call them. Or rather, just these huge fortified structures, often set on hills. They were the safest place to be. Places like the Palace of Knossos on Crete, or the Palace of Mycenae in the Peloponnese. Life was about living, but it was also about security, so that you could keep living. The men and women of this time needed to fit these expectations in whatever ways that worked best. The, the, this often defaulted to men being like the protectors and women being the nurturers. I say that rudely. I mean, it's ultimately, you know, it's fine, Liv. <laughs> women can provide something that men, in this strictly binary sense, I should say, cannot. Babies. And no matter how well a village is protected, that protection does not remain if you are not like continuously supplying new protectors. It sounds bad now, but it does help to look at the perspective of that time. You get it. If, and just for simplicity's sake, let's say the population gender binary was like 50-50, it, 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 if half of your population is constantly dying, either through conquest or through protecting your town, you've got to refresh it, refle refresh that supply somehow. I suppose you could go off and, I don't know, like kidnap some people or something, which, let's be honest, they also did. But really, the easiest way is to establish this, like, cultural precedent for women, that the emphasis should be on them having babies, creating more humans. The circle, it goes on. And then it just goes on and on and on. And certainly in the case of Athens, it devolves a bit into this idea that women are good for one thing only, making babies. Maybe they can also weave sometimes when they're not too pregnant. Good times. As someone who never wants kids and deeply dislikes interacting with children at all times, it sounds like a real nightmare. Still, we're not going to dwell on that because it is simply no fun. So we're going to move on. Let's talk marriage. Just like in, say, the origins of the Trojan War, marriage for political influence can go both ways. All those Greek men compete for who gets to marry Helen. And they do this not only because she's most beautiful, but also because in marrying Helen, the man gets to be the king of Sparta. So in cases like these, they're not getting just a wife to just make babies. They're also getting a kingdom. Now, of course, this is mythologically 
lacking in some logic because, for instance, I mean, Helen has two brothers, so why aren't either Castor or Polyduques king? Let alone the fact that Sparta famously had two kings, so that would really fit. But no, this is a myth, and it's also a myth that comes before the notion of the two kings. So instead, when Menelaus eventually marries Helen, he becomes the king of Sparta. Meanwhile, there's alternatives, like Agamemnon, his brother, marries her sister, and he brings Clytemnestra back to Mycenae with him, where she will then become queen alongside him. While myth, it's still a good indicator of how many of these things could have gone around the Bronze Age, or early Iron Age periods, how political marriages often were. And even though it's myth, it's often most of what we have to learn from, from this time period, because they're not writing marriage practices down in terms of reality. Still, and particularly when we're looking at women like these two, we unfortunately can't go giving anyone too much credit in terms of giving women, you know, agency and freedom. Here's a line from this Pomeroy book. Quote, The dramatic importance and emotional influence of women should not at all be mistaken for evidence of their equality. The political power of even the queens of ancient Greece was sometimes transient, nearly always double-edged blessing. Pomeroy also makes some really interesting observations about how things might have gone for women, both in their marriages and beyond, based on things that are included specifically in Homeric epic. Like, the idea that women are not allowed to take other lovers, while men are explicitly and allowed and even expected to bring home enslaved women for sex, if they so choose. Like, Agamemnon brings home Cassandra and just expecting Clytemnestra to welcome her. Whereas Clytemnestra being with Aegisthus all that time is this horrible crime. Pomeroy also points out that while virginity, or rather just the notion of sex before marriage, becomes something more taboo in later periods when it comes to women, it isn't necessarily the end of the world according to the Homeric sources, where there are instances of women having children before marriage and granted claiming that gods impregnated them, but regardless, they're still able to go on and marry heroes after that, and things are fine, whereas the same certainly wouldn't be true in, say, classical Athens. And one of the most important things about women's roles in the ancient world revolves around how they spend their time. Lots of housework, basically making clothes, weaving shit, and whatever household things they could do while inside, away from the prying eyes of dudes. Again, this is particularly in Athens. And that isn't to say they were alone. I'm sure they would get together and do these types of things with other women, gossiping or maybe doing sexy things amongst themselves. Again, that's my assumption, mostly because I think it is both fun and uh, gives us the idea that women led happier lives than much of the evidence might suggest. One of the really interesting ways, though, this household indoor work manifests is actually in, like, artwork or even pottery. So women are often called white-armed, and in pottery they're often painted white, whereas the men are portrayed with darker skin, or rather the skin of, like, the pottery itself, the pottery style itself, I should say, red figure, black figure, what have you. This isn't a race thing, let's be clear, and it isn't about any kind of whiteness that's being ascribed to them, or or whiteness being better than darker skin. Instead, it's a commentary simply on, like, how much sun the women would have gotten. They're inside, so they're paler than the men in whatever skin tone that might be. We even have some direct evidence of how women might have spent their time in the Bronze Age, particularly in Pylos, in the Peloponnese. And this is like direct, actual evidence. So there was found clay tablets written in Linear B, which is the language of the Bronze Age Mycenaean people. And those tablets actually list tasks of women, including, say, like gathering water, putting together baths, they spin and weave, and some other food-related harvesting tasks. Basically, through that, we get this like actual direct idea of what they do versus having to interpret it from all these literary sources like we have to do with so many other things. Ultimately, though, you know, women liked to weave. We loved to weave. Or rather, we're forced to love to weave. <laughs> 
So it turns out I could spend hours talking about this stuff because I've uh, barely passed the Bronze Age period and have only made the tiniest dent in this book. And, you know, we're 4,000 words into this episode. So needless to say, there will be more women-related episodes in the future once we've done a whole lot more mythology because, frankly, I miss it desperately after all of this history. I do love history, but gods, I'm better at mythology. Still, let's look at just a little bit more of the role women played in the ancient world. One of the things that was very important throughout much of ancient Greek history is their role in funerals and rituals for the dead. There are all these phrases I used to read in epic and tragedy before I knew all the context around funerals and and women's roles. Like, yeah, they would tear their cheeks and rip at their hair. And it, it always sounded so violent and I was sort of bothered by it. And, it. and I mean, it was, but now I understand it all better. It's just like representative of the fact that women were actually allowed to show emotion in a different way than men. It's not necessarily that they would always have such violent rituals around death, but that they were actively involved in the emotional aspect of mourning and and paying respects to the dead. When you see it that way, it's nicer. It's kind of empowering that they had this kind of freedom to show what was in themselves when they were going through such a traumatic experience. The women would also be involved in the washing and dressing of the bodies afterwards, similarly to how they would actually care for their children. It's, it's lovely in all the ways that it's sad. As Palmer explains, quote, The cycle of life takes us from the care of women and returns us to the care of women. And finally, one cannot have an episode about the real women of the ancient world without at least mentioning one of the most famous and one of the very few women that we know so explicitly about. Sappho. Of course, I've done a couple of episodes on Sappho in the past because she's fascinating and I hope to do more on her, but I can't have this episode exist and not have her mentioned at all. So a reminder, our girl Sappho was a poet on the island of Lesbos. Slur Island, as some will understand. Modern Lesvos. And she is the reason for the word lesbian. She was, well, a lesbian. Explicitly, she was a lesbian because she was from the island of Lesbos. But the connotation comes in because she also wrote love poems directed at women. Now, defining Sappho's sexuality isn't really possible or necessary. She could have been interested in anyone. But what's interesting is that she did, indeed, write love poetry directed at other women. Plus, she was just generally cool. She was this archaic poet, like 7th or 6th century, whose poetry not only survives in some form, but was also incredibly famous in the ancient world. Only one of her full-length poems survives at least that we're sure was her there's a whole thing there but there are so many fragments that give us more insights into her work and it's through Sappho that we know there were a number of women poets on the island of Lesbos they there were others elsewhere too but it seems like Lesbos was almost a safe space for them and maybe even a place for women to go if they like wanted to be a poet or already were Sappho is utterly fascinating and I could talk about her forever Uh, We will have more on Sappho in the future. Also, I'm just going to be a nerd and share that in modern Greek, it's pronounced Sappho, which I love. It's a reminder of how beautiful Greek is. Now, frankly, I had every intention of going deeper into the role of women in the ancient world and in Athens really specifically. (laughs) But based on the research Michaela has given me, it's clear that uh, this could be a whole other episode in itself. Fortunately, I also plan to speak to a guest for a conversation episode about just that, women in Athens, so you can all look forward to more episodes on women in the future. Who would have thought that 4,000 years worth of ancient women would require more than one episode, even though they've been notoriously understudied and are all too often entirely missing from the historical record? Lucky for all of us, recent decades and countless scholars are trying to remedy that bullshit. Turns out the women of the ancient world are deeply, entirely fascinating, and we should all care a hell of a lot more about them. But then you're listening to this podcast, so I don't think I have to convince you all that much. (laughs) Women are fascinating. We'll talk about them more in the future, because I am me, and would you expect anything less?
Ugh, nerds. Thank you, as always. This was very fun. I just want to know everything about ancient women. Like, everything? I'm always looking for sources, too. So if anyone has anything to recommend to me for future episodes, please always feel free to send me an email. Mythsbaby at gmail.com. I just want to know as much as humanly possible and share it all with you. Remember, tomorrow you're getting a bonus episode, a re-airing of my episode on wronged women of mythology. Women whose stories are bastardized by their writers or their interpreters. That was a fun one. So I'm excited for you all to listen to it again or maybe for the first time. But next week, next week, I thought it was more than appropriate to return to my beloved Euripides for real and not his gross Aristophanian form. So we are going to talk about the Euripides play, The Orestes, which is the story of Orestes, but is also wild because it's Euripides. So stay tuned. And as always, let's end this with a five-star review reading, shall we? This one is straight and to the point. A reminder that you can write literally anything and give me five stars and I will love you forever. It comes from a user called Nick underscore at. Love the narration. All love to you, Liv. From India, by the way. See? Straight and to the point. Thank you. Let's talk about Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith. Gods is the Hermes to my Olympians, handles so many podcast-related things. In this episode, she did immense research, unbelievably helpful. Did I forget that I asked her to do the research, but thankfully we were there in person talking to each other about it, and she reminded me, yes, what a lifesaver. My brain could not exist without Michaela at this point. Stephanie Foley works to transcribe the podcast for YouTube captions and accessibility. She does amazing work. The podcast is hosted and monetized by iHeartMedia. Help me continue bringing you the world of Greek mythology and the ancient Mediterranean by becoming a patron, where you'll get bonus episodes and more. Just visit patreon.com slash mythsbaby or click the link in this episode's description. Thank you all, as always. Gods, this is fun. I am Liv, and I love this shit. Mm-hmm.